officially uh, good afternoon and welcome to our Tech 5143 class number one, section one, research and technology. And today we have uh, two guest speakers. Guess what? And you already started introduced, have been introduced to the speaker, and the, uh, Claudia will be introduced in a minute. And they will talk to us about research. Now, let me just uh, give you a heads up about uh, them. Uh, they are researchers. Are you with me? Here is a tip for your report. His name is Jim Painter, like somebody who paints. Jim Painter, okay? And he is a multi-talented uh, uh, person. He is a speaker, he is a writer, he is an author, he is a researcher, he is uh, a dietitian, he is a former chair of the School of Technology, I mean the School of Family Consumer Sciences in this building, and he is a nationwide, I'm not sure international also, seems Hyderabad, a speaker, and uh, he is a champion of the portion theory in dietetics. If you don't know what this portion theory, you can ask him while he is speaking. And uh, he and Claudia wanted to bring us some goodies. And you bet it is healthy because it's coming from health. Neither did. There, okay. So without much ado, would you please give them a big hand before the goodies? Thanks. All righty. So in addition to working here at Eastern, I am the um, Director of Nutrition Research for the California Raisin Marketing Board, so I work out of California. I'm the nutrition scientist for sun-made raisins, and so my office is full of raisins. And since you're from India, you like raisins, right? Raisins? You must like raisins. You're from India? Don't you eat raisins in India? Yeah. Oh, there you go. And then I also work for Paramount Farms Pistachio Health, so you can open that up. I had a hard time opening it, so I'm going to let you open it. And um, I'm on the scientific advisory board for Paramount Farms Pistachio Health, and so we've got an office full of pistachios. Do you like pistachios? You're from India. You've got to like pistachios. Can you pass those around? And can you pass those that way? That's the first exam, just to get that paper open. We're going to watch her get them open, because she's doing it so well. <laughs> OK, are you ready? Oh, class, are you ready? Did I throw you off with all the food? Oh, class. Are you ready? Are you ready? Are you sure you're ready? So what we have for you today is finding truth. And today what we're doing is finding truth in the failed theories of heart disease. You may not know this as technology people, but when you have a heart attack, when you go to the doctor in India or anywhere else, pretty much, what do the doctors tell you not to eat? What? Olive oil? <laughs> oh. <laughs> Oily foods. Fatty foods is the number one thing. Uh, they'll tell you that. What else do they tell you not to eat? No, no cholesterol. That's right. The second thing. Stress is another one. What about eating? No, no cholesterol. No fat. What else do they say? Red meat. Cut down on red meat because of saturated fat. And then they tell you not to eat much sodium. And what I'm going to tell you is those things are all wrong. And so we've done a little study of finding truth in the failed theories of heart disease. How did we end up so wrong? For 40 years we've been wrong. Here's what happened. And I was talking to Wafik about this. If you just look at LDL cholesterol, you know what that is? Is that good or bad cholesterol? This is the bad cholesterol. LDL is the bad. And so HDL is the good. And so for years, 10, 20 years, we looked at LDL, and we looked at saturated fat, made bad cholesterol go up. But what we didn't look at is what it did to HDL. It made it go up too. And then the combination of those two, it's the ratio of those that's really important. 
it shows that if you look at the ratio of HDL to LDL, the saturated fat didn't change it at all. And so we've been wrong for 40 years. And still, poly and monounsaturated fat do. What's the bad kind of fat these days? Have you heard of trans fat? Yeah. So trans fat actually makes cholesterol go up. So we thought this for many years. How did we get to the point where this country and every other country told people to eat less fat and less saturated fat because of inductive reasoning? You looked at atherosclerosis. What's in there? Fat. What's in there? Cholesterol. Cholesterol and fat must be bad. Well, lo and behold, we found out that how much you eat here, as far as cholesterol, has nothing to do with where it ends up here. And so inductive reasoning took us down the wrong road for 30 years. We were looking at the wrong thing. OK. So this is dietary fat intake and coronary heart disease, looking at a study for 20 years by Harvard University. Next slide. And what this shows is when you look at all the data from all these years with this Harvard study that's since 1986, it shows that after, if, as you have intake go up with cholesterol and with fat, this is change in risk with fat. Yes, with fat. This is saturated fat right here. It doesn't do anything. Trans fat made it go up. Polyunsaturated fat made it go down. But this shows again, saturated fat's not the villain we thought it was. We thought it was for 40 years because of inductive reasoning, thinking, well, it was fat in those, in those arteries. It must be caused by fat, but it's not. So what does cause it then? Chain leak makes a difference. So when you talk about saturated fats, some are worse than others. Um, go ahead. Go ahead to the meta-analysis. And I just, it's hard to see, but this is what a meta-analysis looks like. This looks at all these studies. This is the average of those studies. And if you look at saturated fat, it doesn't, on average, make cholesterol go up at all. And here, down here, is uh, stroke. It actually makes it go the other way. Stroke is, is protective when you have saturated fat. All right, next slide. So I want to share with you coconut oil is full of saturated fat. People thought that it was bad for many, many years. And here's a study from Korea. Go back up to the name of it. <laughs> Kerala, South India. Ever heard of it? What is it? Kerala. OK. Have you ever heard of this guy, Dr. Kumar? Probably not. And so it's Department of Medicine, College of uh, whatever is in Kerala, South India. So what did he find out? So we, we thought that coconuts were bad. And this is one of the first studies that came out to show that they were. And this looks at the patients, the people that had heart disease. On average, they ate 5,024 coconuts in a lifetime. And then those people that didn't have heart disease, they ate 5,241. They ate an extra 200 coconuts. And they're the ones that didn't have heart disease. So this is one of the first studies that we looked at showing that coconut oil was actually beneficial. And this study is from 1997. So we've known about it for a while. Next. And this is a little study that uh, Claudia did. She's one of my grad students. And we asked people, uh, where did you ask them? Um, what they thought were the major um, contributors to heart disease. And this is what we found. We found out that 95% of the students thought it was. Faculty, it was about 93%. And the truth is, is that fat and cholesterol, especially this dietary fat, has nothing to do with heart disease. All right, next. So cholesterol. I'm going to let Claudia. Claudia's been studying this. I sent her off for two and a half months to do nothing else but study cholesterol and find out what the truth is. And she's going to tell you a little bit about it. Hi everyone, I'm Claudia and I'm a dietetics graduate student here and I work with Dr. Painter doing research. And like he said, I've been doing research on cholesterol. So we looked back, we were trying to figure out where the guidelines originally came from, the 300, less than 300 milligrams per day of cholesterol, and we couldn't really find it. Dr. Painter even talked to some famous scientists and they weren't able to tell him. We talked to the... Um, American Heart Association, who highly endorses this, and they didn't know where the 300 came from. But this just shows that since 1980, they've been saying that we should be eating less than 300 milligrams of cholesterol. But there's really no basis for it. So again, how did we come up with that? How did we come up with that thought? You look at atherosclerosis. What's in there is cholesterol. So inductively, we think it must be cholesterol that caused it. But then as we look at the research, we find out that 
find out it doesn't. It doesn't have anything to do with that. So then this just shows you the nutrition label that you see on most food products. You might even be able to see it on the raisins and the pistachios that you have. And it, right here it tells you that you should be consuming less than 300 milligrams of cholesterol. So where did these recommendations come from? They're based off of animal studies that they've done in the past that don't really apply to humans. Studies that take into account that do not take into account, sorry, other risk factors such as smoking or intake of other foods, and then studies that provided excess amounts of dietary cholesterol, so amounts that you wouldn't normally have in your diet. So then this just shows that in 1912, they um, found that feeding cholesterol to rabbits led to atherosclerosis. However, rabbits do not metabolize cholesterol the same way we do because they're herbivores. So they're not exposed to cholesterol. They, they do not naturally produce it in the body like we do. So how do we get in this bad situation again? We took a study from an animal that doesn't eat meat, and we gave it cholesterol, and lo and behold, it caused atherosclerosis in the poor little bunny. <laughs> but it doesn't eat meat. And so it wasn't an accurate representation of us, yet this is one of the main studies that the whole thing was built on 30 years ago. And then this slide just shows that um, in 2000, the AHA themselves, so the American Heart Association, stated that they had no basis to where their 300 milligrams of cholesterol per day recommendations came from. However, they still endorse it. Yeah, we called them, and I asked them five times, where did this recommendation come from? And they said, we're revising our recommendations. I said, I get it, I get it, you're revising it. Where did this one come from? And she said, we're revising our recommendations. I said, I don't need to know if you're revising them. Where did this one come from that's still on your web page? And she said, sir, we're revising our recommendations. Okay. That's what we call John Urza, a good friend of mine at the University of Illinois. He is the main man in nutrition nationwide. The dietary reference intake that governed how much we're supposed to eat. He is the chairman of the standing committee for the dietary reference intake. So I asked him, John, where did this come from? And he said, the American Heart Association. Oh, Kent, isn't it loud enough to get us? No? And so we asked John, and he said, this came from the American Heart Association. And we asked them three times. They didn't know where it came from. And so how do you get a nationwide policy that spreads around the world and if there's no basis? Again, it's an inference. It's induced from what we saw in the body without any data. We induced, this is what happened. And we went with that for 40 years. Yeah. So, who actually has the drugs? Oh, do the pharmaceutical companies have any say in this? Well, who makes the drugs that lower cholesterol? Pharmaceutical companies. Who is the one that really wants to show that lowering cholesterol will actually reduce risk for heart disease? Drug companies. And so, who's been pushing this? Well, I think misinformation of good scientists did. And then also, drug companies who can make money on it push the idea because, again, it made them money. And so does money influence public policy? What do you think? Yeah. And it's sad when it gets in there and we can't get it out. But that's true. Um, so should you go to your doctor and say, I'm not going to take the medicine? What really does work on this um, is just change your diet. And then you go back to your doctor, he'll take you off the medicine. Never stop the medication. So I had a friend of mine, he's my height, he's twice my weight. And uh, he started taking psyllium seed husk every morning. It's Metamucil, it's a fiber you can drink. And he did it for three months. After three months, he went back to his doctor and his cholesterol dropped from 260 down to 140 in three months. And his doctor said, wow, what are you doing? He said, well, I take Metamucil every morning. And he goes, wow, I don't know what you're doing, but..." Keep it up. And he said, I just told you I take Metamucil every morning. And the doctor says, I sure don't know what you're doing, but keep it up. And so the idea that fiber could actually have that much of an effect didn't even hit the doctor's consciousness when you said it five times. And, uh, and the, the doctor said, if you change your diet, he said, look at me, doc. I weigh 250 pounds. Does it look like I changed my diet? No. What are you doing? I take Metamucil. Never hit his consciousness. So do you need to change what your doctor says? No, if you start doing things right, 
your body will adapt. And then the doctor took him off of his cholesterol medication. And to go back on the last question you had, we actually came across a study where it showed that um, patients that were taking the medication, they reduced their cholesterol, but their arteries were still clogging regardless of taking that medication. So here's a study done by Keys, and the study done by Keys um, kind of dates back, and that's where the recommendations kind of came from. He was against dietary cholesterol, um, and what happened here is um, he had 22 countries that he had data for, but he only chose the seven that supported his hypothesis that cholesterol was harmful. And then um, a British physician um, actually got the data from the other 20, or from the other um, countries, and he actually found there was an inverse relationship. So the more fat and cholesterol you consumed, the less your risk for heart disease was. So that's lying with numbers, pulling out half the. So that's lying with numbers, pulling out half the data. So what this doctor did is he had 22 countries. He used seven of them to prove his point. But then someone went back and looked at all the data and fat and cholesterol going up, instead of making heart disease go up, if you looked at all the countries, it actually made risk of heart disease go down. And so, yeah, money influences it, people's opinions do, and then taking only part of the data can also screw it up. Okay, and then this just looks at the recommendations from other countries, and it shows that the United States is one of the only countries that continues to follow the less than 300 milligrams of dietary cholesterol. And then this looks at another study that shows that the more um, cholesterol you intake, uh, the less your risk for heart disease is. So here's men. Here's adjusted risk. Sorry. If you eat less than one egg, your risk is set at one. And then if you eat more than one egg, your risk goes up by 9%, two to four eggs, it goes up 16%. If you have five to six eggs, your risk drops by 3%. Well, that's kind of screwy. That doesn't follow what they say. And then over here, women, if you have one egg, it's set at zero, one, 1.0. And then if you have one egg or more, your risk drops by 25%. If you have two to four, it drops by five. And if you have five to six, it drops by 3%. So risk actually drops with increased egg consumption. And eggs have about 280 milligrams each. So if they're obviously consuming more than one, they're definitely surpassing the dietary recommendation of 300 milligrams. And this, once again, looks at um, egg consumption. And it shows that it increases the HDL, which is a good type of cholesterol. And there's the same ratio between bad and good cholesterol, which is what you want. You want that balance. Well, and so what we did in the beginning is we looked at LDL. So looking at children, at women, LDL goes up, no change, no change. Men and women, LDL went up. They said, oh, my goodness, eggs are bad. But then if you look at good cholesterol, it went up in every single group. And if you look at the ratio between the two, HDL to LDL, the ratio, which is the important part, no change in any one of the subjects. So one of the problems was we looked at this information for 20 years, and we never looked at this. And when we looked at the rest of the information, we found out it really wasn't harmful at all. And then this again looks at the egg consumption and the effects on LDL and HDL. You know, I should say that in addition to those two companies, I'm a spokesperson for a national egg company. They heard me give this talk about five years ago. And I don't do what I do and say what I say because companies tell me. Companies hear what I say and then come to me and say, will you speak for us? And so I give 12 talks a year for a national egg company once they heard me give this talk. This shows if your cholesterol is 130, that's a little bit high. It should be below 100. And if you eat an egg, it goes up to 134. It goes up by 4 milligrams per deciliter. That's an increase of 1%. If your cholesterol is high, 150, and, and you eat an egg, it goes 154, that increases it by 0.7% only. If your cholesterol is really high, you're really in danger. You could have a heart attack any moment. Your cholesterol is from 170 to 174. It goes up by 0.3%, and the ratio doesn't change at all. And so are eggs harmful? We've taught it now for decades. They're really not. Okay, 
Okay, and then this is from a study that um, asked people how concerned they were about dietary cholesterol. And as we can see over the years, so from 1997 to 2004, um, they were slightly less concerned, but obviously there was still some concern there, which means that they still believe that misconception. And then this goes back to the study I did where I asked consumers, students, and faculty what, um, how much of a risk factor they thought uh, cholesterol was, and they all, I mean, it's all above 50%. So consumers, over 85%, students, about 80%, and then faculty, almost 95%. And since this is wrong, it doesn't, who do better, students or faculty? Students. Students were less fooled than the faculty. They almost all thought that it was a risk factor and cholesterol is not, and only 80% of the students did. Okay, that's our last slide, right? I think so. Okay. So, how do we get to this point? The most important thing when, as a scientist to me. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I hate this thing. So, as a scientist, what I'm always looking for is the whole truth. If you get part of the truth, you're sunk. You can lie with numbers by getting part of the truth and proving your point. You can always find a study to, produce, to prove something. So you have to look at all the studies, look at meta-analyses. And now we're finally doing that after three decades, four decades, of telling people the wrong information. So comments, questions? No questions? <laughs> oh, that's good. Thanks for having us. What? OK, thanks.